All right, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and uh, uh, the ability to participate in this session. I think it's uh, really exciting to see all this work um, going on at this time, and this is my first time at this meeting, and so it's uh, a refreshing. Usually I go to neuroscience meetings and I have to explain a lot of the tool development aspects of what we're doing, and here uh, that's kind of just appreciated and understood. So. That's been really fantastic. Um, so my lab is interested in un understanding how gene regulatory mechanisms in uh, the brain help to establish the physiology and function of the nervous system during development and then in the adult nervous system, how those me same mechanisms can be um, regulated by activity-dependent, experience-dependent processes to achieve things like memory formation, plasticity of the brain, and can be disrupted in disease states. Um, and so, so Beverly really nicely introduced this concept of genome editing, and I, I don't really think I have to introduce this at this meeting. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is not using CRISPR-Cas9 as a DNA editing tool for, uh, for gene regulation, uh, but using these uh, CRISPR-DCAS9 approaches, which have recently been described and can be utilized in a number of different ways. So uh, these dead Cas9 uh, approaches uh, take advantage of uh, uh, inactivation of the two nuclease domains in the Cas9 protein. This basically turns this from a DNA editing system into a genomic anchoring system. And this allows targeted uh, uh, genomic recruitment for gene activation, repression, uh, gene localization, uh, and uh, even non-coding RNA localization in the genome. Um, so early, uh, uh, early studies showed that you can fuse transcriptional activators to these dead Cas9 proteins. In this example, fusion of a, a VPR, which is a robust transcriptional activator that's really a concatamer of three different activators. Uh, recruitment of this VPR protein to a target gene promoter can drive transcription of that gene. Of course, you can fuse repressors to the DCAS9 to accomplish repression. You can fuse uh, reporter molecules for localization in the genome. This is an early result from the laboratory of George Church showing that uh, this VPR um, strategy um, uh, works very well for uh, a, a targeted upregulation of a number of different genes, in this case targeting some of the transcription factors that are responsible for neur neuronal differentiation. And you can see here not only that VPR was very effective as compared to a negative uh, uh, control, but also versus the previous generation of these activator proteins, VP64. And so we were very excited uh, to use this strategy in the lab. And, and if uh, you're not familiar with George's work, he's giving a presidential lecture later today. Um, uh, but we wanted to, of course, use these in primary neurons and eventually in these intact brain. And so a lot of these early papers have been describing these systems in dividing cell lines, which are easy to transfect, easy to insert transgenes into. Um, and we're using primary neurons, and we're using intact brain, and we're using uh, a rat model system in the lab, which has not uh, traditionally been amenable to gene regulation in this way. And so this introduced a number of challenges to us. How do we get the genes into the cells that we're trying to study? Of course, uh, this relies largely on uh, viral delivery methods to accomplish this. And, uh, you know, um, that can be an inefficient process in neurons, and uh, uh, you, you start to care about, you know, targeting different neurons in different areas of the brain. And so when we just decided to start working with this, one of the first questions we had was, well, first we developed this uh, capacity to introduce this via a lentiviral delivery system because we needed the cargo capacity of this uh, uh, delivery system for the adult uh, central nervous system. And we have a modular approach, and so uh, one lentivirus drives the guide RNA, also an MCR reporter. A second lentivirus drives the DCAS9 VPR uh, transgene. And we needed to select a promoter for this. The original church paper used a CMV promoter, and we wanted to try to avoid that in neurons because it's known that this is an activity-dependent promoter. It has uh, several Krebs elements, and so it can be regulated itself by activity states in neurons, and we thought that was an obvious kind of caveat for trying to use this in neurons. There's also some evidence that, that the CMV promoter can be silenced by methylation and can downregulate expression of the transgene. 
So in hex cells, we tried a number of different promoters, EF1-alpha, PGK, CAG, and SIN, and targeting the human uh, FOS gene, which is an activity responsive gene in neurons. It's broadly used to mark neuronal activity. We're able to get upregulation with any of these uh, promoters. And so we, we decided to move forward in a rat dividing cell line, C6 cells. Again, any of these promoters work to drive expression of, a, of the FOS gene, this, in this case, in the rat genome. However, when we move to primary neurons, we find that uh, only one of these, the human synapsin promoter, is effective at driving uh, uh, FOS upregulation in this case. And so this was really surprising to us, uh, for one, because we also use the F1-alpha to drive the m cherry reporter in the guide vector, and it works well for that. But for some reason, it doesn't work well for driving the Cas9 VPR expression. And so we wondered why this was. We thought maybe it was because, uh, you know, we're packaging these into lentiviruses in the lab, and we thought maybe the lentiviruses that were utilizing the other promoters were just not as effective. And so we measured viral integration into the genome. Of course, lentiviruses are genome-integrating viruses. And we found that actually the synapsin uh, uh, promoter viruses were the least effective of the three that we used at integrating into the genome. Um, however, despite that, they produce, uh, uh, when we measured the actual DCAS VPR mRNA, they produced nearly five times the amount of mRNA as the EF1 alpha uh, promoter. And if we normalized uh, mRNA expression to proviral integration, we see that on a, a, a matched basis or ratio, there's actually 10 times more of the VPR transgene being expressed from the human synapsin promoter. So we think this is why this is more effective as compared to these other two promoters. And we decided to move forward with this. And you can see here this produces really robust expression. There's a flag tag on the DCAS VPR transgene. So we can use uh, this for immunocytochemistry, uh, showing a very robust expression as you see here. And we can target a number of different genes of interest. We're in, interested in a lot of activity responsive genes in the genome, uh, EGR1, FOS, and FOSB. You can see here that changing the sgRNA target, which is shown on uh, the, the left side of the slide, uh, uh, changes which of the genes are induced by this approach. So EGR1 mRNA goes up only when we target EGR1. FOS goes up only when we target FOS. FOSB goes up only when we target the FOSB promoter. And this works in a variety of cell types, so we target uh, many of these genes in cortical neurons, primary neurons, hippocampal primary neurons, striatal primary neurons, works very effectively in these uh, three different types of neurons from diverse areas of the brain. And I would also like to point out here that you can really target genes that were not uh, easily uh, um, approachable for this type of regulation in any conventional system. So RELIN uh, is, a, uh, is a gene that occupies about a half a megabase of genomic DNA in the rat genome. So it's one of the longest genes in the rat genome. And uh, previously, you could not, you know, overexpress the cDNA in, in any kind of conventional vector that would work in primary neurons, and so people were adding the protein directly to cells, and we think that introduces a lot of problems thinking about how, um, uh, you know, mRNA is trafficked and protein uh, translation occurs, and that needs to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, so we think this can avoid, avoid some of the traditional caveats of uh, trying to understand gene regulatory mechanisms. Uh, in the central nervous system. So we wanted to expand this a bit and look at a gene that's uh, very complex in its regulations. So we looked at the uh, uh, gene coding brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is a gene that's uh, absolutely critical for synaptic plastic plasticity, memory formation, synapse development in the nervous system. Uh, but the regulation is complex in that there are nine uh, kind of non-coding exons that are driven by discrete promoters upstream of those exons. And so uh, each one of those UTRs can get incorporated with a transcript that contains the uh, 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 mRNA for uh, coding exon 9, which is the common coding exon. So the final protein product is the same, but you get many different splice variants of uh, uh, the BDNF. Um, um, mRNA. And uh, so 
we wanted to see if we could use this system to ask whether this was specific at the uh, transcript variant level at this complexly regulated gene. So designing a guide RNA that targeted the promoter upstream of BDNF um, um, exon 1, we were able to show that this, with RNA sequencing, that this selectively upregulated the abundance of transcript 1 as compared to all the other BDNF transcripts. Of course, also upregulates the common coding exon that is, that is spliced into uh, the BDNF1 transcript variant. If we target BDNF uh, promoter 4, we get selective upregulation of mRNA containing promoter 4 and really no off-target effects at the other transcript variants at the BDNF gene. Of course, with uh, CRISPR, as, as Beverly uh, very nicely introduced, you're always worried about off-target effects. And so uh, using these uh, uh, transcriptional activation strategies, you're not really looking for edits to the genome, of course, but you're looking for off-target expression of other genes. So we performed RNA sequencing targeting the BDNF1 or the BDNF4 um, promoter, and I'm just showing the BDNF1 uh, uh, data here. This is kind of a mirrored Manhattan plot, and so on the y-axis, we're showing the log two-fold change. So if it's, a, if it's above the white dotted line, it's increased in expression. If it's below that, it's decreased in expression. And this is stratified by chromosome on the x-axis. So what you can see is that when we target BDNF exon 1, BDNF is the most upregulated gene in the genome, which is comforting. Uh, we also identified using uh, an off-target uh, prediction software, CAS off finder, uh, the predicted off-target or mismatch uh, up to four, allowing up to four mismatches in the guide RNA sequence. And these are mapped here in orange. And what you can see is that there's no consistent regulation of these predicted off-target hits in either direction. And so we think this is selective not only at the level of specific BDNF transcripts, but at the level of uh, the entire genome as well. There are many other genes changed. BDNF is an important molecule. And so uh, when you overexpress BDNF, many, many genes do change, but we think these other changes are uh, uh, secondary effects of regulating BDNF and not off-target effects. So if we co-regulate, this, this system is very amenable to uh, uh, multiplexing. If we co-regulate both BDNF1 and BDNF4, which actually commonly occurs in neurons, these variants tend to go up together after neuronal stimulation or plasticity-inducing stimuli. Uh, we find that there's an increase in BDNF protein, about a six-fold increase. Uh, and we wanted to use this to ask uh, what these specific transcript variants do uh, in the context of neuronal function. And so we can just grow primary neurons on these multi-electrode arrays. These are just images of this. You can see the M-cherry reporter coming from the guide RNA expression vector. And each one of these black circles in this image is an electrode that can sense and record extracellular electrophysiological activity of neurons grown in the culture. And we can basically just seed neurons on these electrode arrays, transduce with our viruses, and then record from these multi-electrode arrays at successive days after the viral transduction. And you can see uh, kind of what this looks like here. Neurons exhibit these characteristic action potentials, of course, and we can measure those, quantify them, quantify how many uh, overall action potentials occur, uh, the frequency of those action potentials, how many occur in bursts or kind of uh, uh, discrete uh, rapid succession of action potentials. Uh, and doing that for BDNF, what we can see is that compared to our LAC-Z control, which is, of course, a non-targeting gene that's not found in, in the rat genome, uh, we see increased frequency of neuronal action potentials. This is just time series data. Each one of these rows is a single neuron that we're recording from. Each single tick is a single action potential. And if we quantify this, we can see there's an increased spike frequency resulting from BDNF upregulation, and there's also an increased frequency of burst firing in uh, BDNF1 and 4 upregulated neurons. 
So we wanted to take this further into the adult central nervous system. Uh, we decided to target a region of the brain that we care a lot about in the lab relevant to drug addiction. And uh, this work is funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And so this, uh, the region of the brain highlighted here in green is called the nucleus accumbens. This is the core subregion of the nucleus accumbens, and this is absolutely critical for development of uh, um, motivated behavior towards drugs of abuse and is altered long-term after exposure to drugs of abuse. So on the left side of the brain, in one animal, we're going to target our laxy control guide RNA with our DCAS9 VPR fusion. On the right side of the brain, we're going to target uh, the FOSB gene using a, a specific guide RNA for uh, that uh, gene promoter and uh, uh, express the DCAS9 VPR machinery. And so this is what this looks like. This is an actual slice of the brain. This is this, the, from, the, from the same animal, just uh, targeting a different guide RNA to different sides of the brain. So the, the imcherry reporter uh, is expressed from the guide RNA vector, so we expect to see this on both sides of the brain. This kind of gives, gives you an idea for the spread of the virus using this lentivirus approach. Uh, so we're, we're getting nice induction of imcherry here. Uh, and then we do immunohistochemistry for uh, FOSB protein. FOSB is a transcription factor that localizes to the nucleus, and so that provides a nice kind of punctate marker where we can uh, visualize expression of FOSB and count FOSB positive cells. And what I hope you can see on, on the right side of this slide is that there's a, a, a robust increase in FOSB protein resulting from targeting FOSB with this uh, gene act CRISPR activation system. And if we quantify FOSB positive cells, there's a significant increase in the number of those cells as well, about a fourfold increase. Um, because we're using the human synapsin promoter, which is usually active in neurons, we predicted that this would be, uh, the FOSB induction would be occurring only in neurons, and so using some confocal microscopy, we were able to confirm this. So uh, this image just should, confirms that uh, um, kind of uh, nuclear localization of FOSB uh, in two different slices, and then we co-stain for either NUIN, which is a neuronal protein that's also found in the kind of soma or, and, and nucleus of a cell, and GFAP, which is a, a glial cell marker. And what you can, I hope you can see here, is that if we merge these images, there's really nice co-localization of FOSB with NUIN and not with GFAP, indicating that the upregulation is occurring specifically in uh, neurons in this case. So we can also use this system not just for activation, but using the exact side, same guide RNAs for repression, uh, just swapping out what the effector protein that is fused to the DCAS9 uh, is. And so in this case, we fuse uh, a crab domain, uh, which would be shown here in red, uh, to the DCAS9 instead of VPR, so we can repress um, uh, FOS uh, using a FOS guide RNA, uh, just as we can activate it on the top panel. So we can really use this system for bidirectional gene regulation. Again, this is all in rat primary neurons. So again, we wanted to take this further and really harness the, uh, uh, what I think is the true power of the system, which is that these guide RNAs can be multiplexed and you can regulate not just single genes, as the field has been doing for the past several decades, but entire programs of genes. Uh, you know, genes, uh, especially activity-dependent genes, tend to be regulated together, not one at a time. And so there are whole transcriptional cascades that occur in concert. And so we wanted to, to use this strategy to try to either replicate or block some of those transcriptional programs. So a common type of experiment that my lab will do is to take cultured rat striatal neurons, and we're interested in dopamine signaling and the transcriptional consequences of dopamine receptor activation in neurons. And so in this case, uh, we, we added one micromolar of dopamine to a cell culture uh, for an hour, and then we ex isolated the RNA and performed RNA sequencing. And this is the result of that type of experiment. You can see uh, this is a volcano plot showing the log twofold change on the x-axis, p-value on the y-axis. So the, the genes that are, each dot is a gene. And so uh, the genes that are in the upper right quadrant of this graph are genes that are significantly induced by dopamine receptor activation in our culture model. 
And what we wanted to do was target as many of these as possible for multiplex gene activation or gene repression to really get at what is the function of this program, uh, not you know, any specific gene in this program, but all of the genes together. So we targeted as many as we could. In this case, I'm highlighting 16 that we were able to successfully target. These are the identities of these genes. And um, we had to adapt our strategy here. So before I told you about our uh, guide RNA was uh, being expressed from, from a vector that only contained one guide RNA sequence. And so Catherine Savell, a talented PhD student in the lab, had to uh, engineer a multiplex expression uh, uh, array, essentially, that we could use to target all of these genes at once. And she developed this, uh, what we call, dopoplex sgRNA array. So this is dopoplex because we're multiplexing the genes that are regulated by dopamine and uh, inserted guide RNAs for each of these genes that are upregulated or most upregulated by dopamine receptor activation in, in striatal neurons and culture. Um, this was a lot of work. Uh, it seems easy when I put it on the slide, but Catherine had to uh, uh, clone 52 new guide RNAs, insert all of those individually into lentivirus, screen that in a primary neuronal culture system, and then develop this multiplex vector with Golden Gate Assembly and insert all of the successful guide RNAs into the multi multiplex vector. So not easy, and uh, our, com our control here is going to be just a LAC-Z repeat sgRNA array. So we were able to successfully do this. This is the results of dopaplex induction. This is, again, showing the log twofold change. When we target these genes, we upregulate these genes. That's uh, hopefully not too surprising, but this is, was really technically challenging to do. All of these genes are upregulated. So what are the consequences of upregulating this dopamine-regulated gene program? Uh, there are 670 differentially expressed genes downstream of dopaplex induction using RNA-seq. Some of these are increases, some of these are decreases. But when we look for the functional categories that are enriched in those changes, what we find is that there are, are enrichment of categories involved in synaptic plasticity, ion channel function, et cetera. So we think these are yeah, kind of key, uh, uh, this, this first wave of, of genes that are activated by dopamine are really key uh, 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 transcriptional uh, wave to basically induce the second uh, gene program that, that remodels the function of, uh, of neurons. So again, we can culture these neurons on multi-electrode arrays. This is uh, showing what I showed you before. And then we can just compare our laxy controls to our dopaplex targeting. We can see individual spikes. We can see bursts of spikes. And what you can maybe appreciate here, one of the principal changes we found downstream of dopaplex uh, uh, gene activation is an increase in burst frequency of uh, striatal neurons in culture. Uh, this is using a higher throughput system with about 800 electrodes uh, across 48 wells, and so each of these groups has uh, close to 1,000 neurons that we've recorded from in this system, and you can see there's a significant increase in burst frequency using that. Next, we took this in vivo and expressed these uh, um, uh, in, induce these dopaplex genes in the nucleus accumbens core. Uh, this region is critical for development of a phenomenon called psychomotor uh, uh, um, uh, psychostimulant sensitization. So this is a phenomenon where repeated exposure to a drug of abuse like cocaine or amphetamine causes progressively escalating increases in locomotor activity induced by that. Uh, by that drug. So we infuse the virus, we give the animals a recovery period, we, we give them saline or successive days of uh, uh, cocaine exposure, and then we administer a challenge dose to monitor the induction of locomotor sensitization, expecting that we would see not only acute effects of cocaine, but increased response after the cocaine challenge. So what you can see here is that there's no difference either in the baseline locomotion or in the cocaine-induced locomotion of animals that receive the uh, uh, LAC-C control versus the dopaplex induction. However, there is a significant escalation in locomotor sensitization in animals that receive uh, uh, induction of this dopamine-regulated uh, gene program. 
And this is really exactly what we predicted because we think these genes will be repeatedly induced in vivo by, uh, by drugs like cocaine. And we've also performed RNA-seq to show that many of the same genes induced by cocaine are induced by our dopaplex receptor or dop dopamine receptor activation in vitro. So we think this is at least a proof of principle that modulating an, uh, a, a large extent of a gene program can induce a functional consequence in vivo, such as increased cocaine sensitization. Um, where are we going with this? One of the things that we really want to do is get cell type specificity for this approach. And so Jasmine Ravana, an undergraduate student in the lab, uh, designed a uh, uh, basically a double inverted open reading frame version of this uh, uh, using two heterotypic uh, uh, LOX P uh, LOX uh, sites, inserting these around the DCAS BPR transgene. We add CRE, it flips around, and this is showing our constitutive version that I've been showing you all along. Induction of BDNF1, uh, addition of Cree using this DIO uh, uh, transgene uh, allows selective activation of genes only with Cree on board. Uh, but we want to get even better um, um, kind of uh, temporal control of this process as well. And so uh, Charlie Gersbach and several others have described these uh, light-activated CRISPR effector systems or LACE systems. These use a, a, a light-sensitive protein such as cryptochrome 2 or CRY2, and you can fuse the effector protein in this case directly to CRY2 and fuse a binding partner, SIBN, to the DCAS9 so that when you shine a blue light, in this case CRY2 is sensitive to blue light, there's a conformational change in CRY2. This recruits the effector directly to the target gene. We've done this in the lab, uh, uh, targeting uh, guide RNAs for a luciferase reporter. And as you can see here, this is an actual image of the 96 well plate that we perform these assays in. Control guide RNAs, light does nothing. Uh, targeting the EGR1 promoter that drives this luciferase, turning the light on really induces uh, luciferase uh, activity in the system. This is a quantification of that effect. This is six hours after turning on the light. We do a whole time course experiment, and what we can see is that uh, basically within 30 minutes to an hour of turning the light on, we're getting upregulation of, um, of, lucifer, uh, of uh, luciferase. Of course, this requires protein to be, be made, and so this is actually delayed from the uh, transcriptional effects that we're measuring. And we turn the light off, and it starts to go back down to baseline. There are a number of issues with uh, this system. One is that cryptochrome 2, this is the Arabidopsis cryptochrome 2, but it can dimerize with mammalian cryptochrome 2 and uh, induce genomic targeting effects. And so we wanted to avoid that uh, as much as possible. And so we developed a new system based on the FKF1 in love domain. Uh, we call this system FLIC. Uh, this is uh, FKF1 light inducible CRISPR construct. Uh, there was a, a long selection process involved in naming of this system. But this was really driven by uh, MD-PhD student Corey Duke and an undergraduate student, student Nick Southern in the lab, and they presented this work in a poster on Monday night. And so this uh, utilizes uh, a different Arabidopsis light-dependent system, which is responsible for flowering in Arabidopsis. And basically, uh, exactly as I showed you with the other system, you can recruit an uh, effector to a target gene uh, uh, using this approach. Corey ran through a really tour de force uh, a bunch of different architectures of this system, changing the position of the in love domain relative to the DCAS, adding multiple domains, changing uh, position of the interaction part partner Gigantia, uh, adding multiple versions of that. But what you can see here is that this is uh, the most successful version of this is really comparable to these previous LACE iterations, achieving uh, um, pretty uh, uh, significant upregulation with lower off target or background uh, light off effects, and you can see that expressed here. Of course, this also works really nicely at endogenous genes, not just at luciferase reporters. So we're excited about this moving forward and getting temporal control of this process. I'd just like to thank everyone in the lab that's been working on this. Catherine Savell and Corey Duke and Nick Southern were uh, the ones that I mentioned most of the work from today, and also our funding sources for this, and I'd be happy to take your questions.